All right, today we are going to uh, talk about tiny engine. Okay? So efficient tuning and inference engine on microcontrollers. So uh, we have learned a couple of algorithms techniques that including tiny NAS, uh, or as well network, okay? and also those um, tuning uh, with 2.6 kilobytes of SRAM. Right? So uh, today we are going to talk about how to write fast kernels, okay? fast kernels, memory efficient kernels, so that we can fit uh, those tiny models on uh, microcontrollers, even lower level than what we have learned uh, so far in the optimization stack. Okay? And our key idea is to perform full stack optimizations across algorithms, systems, and hardware. Okay? So this is the agenda for today. It looks pretty dense, but it's very well organized. So we are gonna first introduce what are microcontrollers and why they are essential. Right? Since microcontrollers, is the device we're going to use in lab four. So hopefully this gives you some uh, high level idea what they are um, and also how do we program them, okay? Um, and also we're going to talk about these critical factors of deploying neural nets to microcontrollers. What, what is their memory hierarchy? What is the data layout uh, for neural nets? And part three is the, uh, the, the major component for today's lecture, okay? critical optimization techniques are uh, the implementation details of tiny engine, um, including um, this general uh, and very classic optimization techniques like loop unrolling, reordering, loop tiling. All these are centralized around efficient memory and reducing the data movement. Since we have learned that computation is cheap, memory movement, data movement is expensive. Right? So we are going to uh, do these techniques like tiling, reordering, reduce data movement. CMD image column conversion in place steps wise convolution to reduce data movement, uh, different data layouts, okay? and finally the window grad convolution. So you are going to experience and try to play with uh, these techniques in, in lab four. So it'll be uh, quite an interesting lecture. So let's get started with the first part. Okay? What are microcontrollers and why they are quite essential? So, introduction. To microcontroller, um, very low cost, low power, and they're growing uh, very rapidly in recent years. And the amount of microcontrollers with a, with a year is getting pretty, uh, increasing pretty fast. A lot of applications, personalized healthcare, agriculture, uh, smart home, etc. Um, and they are uh, widely used in a lot of applications, such as uh, in vehicles, okay, in the drive. Uh, uh, autonomous driving vehicle or even conventional vehicle for various control, uh, there's a lot of uh, microcontrollers uh, inside. Okay? Um, robotics, office machines, vending machines, medical devices, uh, mobile radio transceivers, vending machines, home appliances like your know, refrigerator, you know, washing machine. It's very likely that one of um, in, in these devices, uh, in this uh, appliances, one of such microcontrollers is inside. Right? Um, so there are several dozen of microcontroller architectures and different bundles. Uh, they're both lay ARM based. Okay? So uh, STM32 uh, is a 32 bit microcontroller we are going to use in our lab four. Okay? Uh, there are also other bundles, including from PI and also from microchip. So they are mostly ARM architecture. So it's a, a very simple miniature personal computer, right? So without operating system. So there is no uh, paging, no memory management. So we are going to play with the bare metal to uh, manage everything by ourselves. So there are several advantages, right? So for these microcontrollers, very cheap, uh, low cost, and usually uh, manufactured with uh, older technology like 16 nanometer, uh, 28 nanometer, so it's very cost effective, uh, relatively low power, and a small chip area. But in the meantime, there's no free lunch, you know, so usually uh, we suffer from low computational power of these small microcontrollers okay? and very low memory and storage space. We are soon going to visit the amount of capacity for storage for memory available on these microcontrollers. And also there's limited amount of instructions available on such microcontrollers. So 
that's an advantage, and also it is disadvantage. Um, so a microcontroller, you already have the below uh, components. So of course, it contains the CPU. Okay? You really, as an in-order CPU, that is low power, easy, um, and less complicated uh, pipeline. Okay? It's a volatile memory, um, which is the SRAM. You really a couple of, um, no more than a couple of um, hundred kilobytes of SRAM. So very little SRAM. Also have some non-volatile memory, maybe one or two megabytes of flash memory, okay? and also several I.O. ports, peripherals, ABC and BACs. So here's a, give you a rough comparison between uh, the STM32 F746 MCU, which you already have one of them uh, at home, right? We gave you those four for lab four, which is going to be released today. Okay? Uh, this is the board we are going to play with. This is Apple MacBook Pro with M1 Ultra. Ultra right? So we are comparing the CPU cores, the cache, memory capacity, etc. Right? So here, the number of cores is roughly single core versus Apple uh, MacBook Pro. Uh, M1 Ultra is 20 cores. Right? So one is clogged as about 216 megahertz, while the other is uh, three gigahertz, right? an order of magnitude difference in the clock frequency. So what's the uh, what's the benefit of that? Low power, right? Since the, the power consumption is proportional to the frequency, right? It's CV square F, C is the capacity, V is the voltage, uh, and F is the frequency, right? So um, low power due to low frequency. And also no GPU core, of course, New, neural engine, no neural engine on microcontroller versus 32 neural, uh, neural engine cores on that one ultra. Uh, one cache size super small, only eight kilobytes of SRAM uh, for our one cache versus uh, 320 kilobytes. Only one level of cache, no L2, no L3 versus on uh, one ultra, there are as much as like, almost 100 megabytes of L3 cache, which is pretty weird. Uh, memory capacity, there is no VRAM. Um, so uh, only up to 320 kilobytes of SRAM that is both readable and writable versus the storage, you have only one megabyte of read only. Uh, you can program it uh, offline, but uh, the, write, uh, the writing overhead is pretty big versus uh, 64 gigabytes of, uh, of VRAM. And terabytes of uh, storage okay. with operating system, without operating system. Okay. So we have to be able to manage everything by, by ourselves uh, without an operating system. Okay. Our capacity is several orders of magnitude smaller compared with a laptop CPU. Just to give you an idea how small and how low the resource we have. A basic intro about the memory hierarchy, um, which you might have learned in 6004 or in other computer architecture courses. And so the fundamental principle in computer architecture is that uh, computation is cheap. Data movement is expensive. Right? We want to have a both a larger memory and also low latency. Right? So there is no free lunch. If you have high capacity, like uh, SSD or HDD, you have very um, long, uh, long latency, right? But if you want a, a low latency, like in registers, in our cache, it's pretty expensive, right? So we have six transistors for SRAM cell versus only one transistor um, in a DRAM cell, right? So how do we have a, the illusion? We have both a large memory space and also a fast memory. So that is by using cache. If we have get a cache kit, we can benefit from having a very uh, low latency, right? Um, but uh, the size also uh, is pretty small for this R1 and L2 caches. So today we are going to learn by using blocking techniques so that we can enable a better cache locality so that we can hit R1 cache as much as possible, if not L2 cache as much as possible, rather than having to go to the DRAM memory. 
So in comparison, so this is the um, uh, personal computer laptop versus a microcontroller. Right? So we have a couple of levels of L1, L2, L3 cache versus only one level of cache um, on a microcontroller. Right? And the size also differs a lot. Hundreds of kilobytes versus only eight kilobytes of L1 cache. It's only one level of cache, and then we have this 320 kilobytes of SRAM, uh, which is uh, writable and readable, both writable and readable. And then we have one megabyte of flash, which is uh, read only. So, question here if we want to deploy deep neural net for inference, for the weights, and for the activations, where shall we store them in the microcontroller? Is it in a flash or is it in, uh, in the SRAM? Right, exactly. Since uh, the flash is read only, the weight uh, should be uh, in the uh, flash. But activation, we should be able to read and write it. Therefore, it can only reside in the SRAM. Since we have only 320 kilobytes of the SRAM, what's the maximum activation we can have is very clear, right? That's the peak memory we, are, uh, we have available. Considering the input activation, output activation, you have roughly, if you divide it by two, roughly 160 kilobytes for a tensor. And you can quickly calculate what is the dimension and how many channels you can fit. Right? Remember, the way to calculate the activation size is resolution X by resolution Y by the channel. Right? So you can easily calculate how many channels and how much or uh, uh, what, what size of the resolution you can fit given such a uh, tight memory budget. Okay, therefore, uh, how to effectively utilize uh, the L1 cache is one of the uh, most critical factors to boost the uh, performance of your code on a microcontroller. Okay, so we learned these basics uh, what is the available resource? What is the memory hierarchy for microcontrollers? And then we are going to uh, talk about neural networks, the critical factors of deploying neural nets given such resource constraints, especially memory resource constraints. Okay. Why deploying neural networks on microcontrollers is challenging. And also, how should we lay out the data in microcontrollers? Deploying neural nets on microcontrollers is challenging because the existing neural nets like Resin 50, Mobile V2, or the quantized version of Mobile V2, which is about four times smaller than the P32 version, is too big to fit uh, the, the memory constraints, especially the SRAM constraints. Right? Since we mentioned there's only a couple of hundred kilobytes of SRAM in microcontroller, and that's the only readable and writable memory that we have. Flash is read only, right? So that's the peak memory constraint versus for these neural nets, they demand a pretty large, pretty big uh, memory resource as much as six, seven, seven megabytes. Okay. Therefore, um, the techniques like we mentioned, like quantization or pruning, neural architecture search plays a very important role, role here. Um, but even after quantization, it's still like five times bigger. So conventionally, people can do such toy examples, classifying apples and oranges under low resolution, right, on microcontrollers. But MCU nets, including the tiny engine that we uh, will discuss later, enable us to do image net level classification, reaching 70% top line image net accuracy on the microcontroller. Okay. Well, the flash memory was that programmed exactly once, and then you know you change the memory program like like it before. Yeah, it's programmed once you are at the programming time, and then um, writing to that is super expensive. Yeah. Uh, particularly for uh, for microcontroller, but for like USB drive, that's also flash. That flash is um, is off chip, but this flash is actually on chip, so that's why um, the characteristic is different. Yeah. 
It's a single chip that you can't have it. Okay, so this is uh, back to our previous question. Given the neural network, we have weights. We also have activations. Where do we store the weights and activations? Uh, we didn't discuss that. Uh, we have to store the weights in the flash. Okay. Uh, when we are calculating a certain layer, we just bring the weights of that layer uh, to SRAM when we are processing that. So if, we, uh, so if these activations need to be readable and also writable, we have to only, we can only store them in the SRAM, which is about 300 kilobytes or 256 kilobytes, depending on the microcontroller that you are using. So uh, since memory is the, mem uh, the, the key bottleneck of deploying deep neural nets into microcontrollers, we are going to talk about several data layouts. How do we um, store these weights and activation tensors in the microcontroller? What are the choices? And which one would be more uh, expensive and which one would be, uh, would be cheaper? So, um, so let's brainstorm a little bit. How should we store those tensors? For weight and for activations, they are both um, how many dimensions are the weights and, and activations? Imagine uh, a batch size of only one, since we are doing real time processing. What's the dimension for the weight and activation for each layer? Four and three. Right. So for weight, we have input channel, output channel, and um, kernel X, kernel Y. Right? So it's four dimension tensor. And for activation, we have x y we have channel right? so that's three dimensions um so this is a representation of a actually a four uh dimensional tensor right? so this is x y the number of channels okay? and we have two of them uh, maybe the output channel dimension okay so this is the input channel channel dimension this is two output channels therefore uh, we have four dimensions for the uh for the weight and there are several ways to lay out um, the uh, weights and activation kind of tensors in the map. Right? Um, one method, so here, so let's first discuss the terminology. N stands for the uh, batch dimension, the outer uh, dimension. It can, it can mean, for the activation, it can mean uh, the number of images, the batch dimension. And for the weight, it means the output channel. How many kernels do we have, and how many output channels do we have? So that's the n dimension. We also have the c dimension, which is the uh, channel dimension. Okay. So for weight, uh, that is exactly the input channel dimension. Okay. For activation, that is just the channel dimension. H and W for activation, that's the resolution H and W. For kernel, that's the kernel size. Okay, three by three. Three by three or five by five. So NCHW uh, means uh, the height and weight dimension are there in the inner loop. And C is the max uh, outer, and N is the outside. Right? So here uh, we made a uh, animation to represent that. If you have uh, NCHW, if first element is here, um, so this is the H dimension, this is the uh, W dimension. This is the channel dimension, and if we repeat that, we have the n dimension. Right? So, uh, if we have n c h w, uh, the inner loop, the uh, the dimension that is changing the fastest is actually the w dimension. Therefore, if we increment the pointer by one, we are actually uh, proceeding in the w dimension. Okay? Since w is, is to the right, so after we fill in all the um, Ws we go to the next uh, h dimension, and after we fill the entire uh, three by three, we go to the next channel. Okay, next channel. So we go to the next channel. Okay, we continue on the uh, w dimension, and then uh, h dimension, h dimension, and then we move forward to the next channel. Okay? Finally, we fill in all the channels within a n. And then we move to the next n dimension, okay? The next n dimension, and restart from this um, 
H and W, and then another C, and then another C all the way to the end. Okay, so this is the data layout for NCHW, uh, which is used by default by Cafe. Uh, any of you have heard of this tool called Cafe? Some of you, maybe. Um, when I was doing PhD, it basically there was no PyTorch, no TensorFlow yet. That was in 2015, 2014, right? So um, Cafe was at that time the most popular infrastructure and a tool that we use to train neural nets. And this using the NCHW uh, data layout. There's another one, right? So NHWC format. So how does that look like? We have the C and the channel dimension in the uh, inner group, right? Meaning that um, this is the first dimension we are going to have the consecutive data layout. So um, if we put the first number here, where should we put the second number? Next channel, yeah. The zero, zero, 001 should be put here. Right? Um, and then similar for the for the next number. So they are, are labeled in different number, but this is showing the sequence in the memory layout. Right? Um, so we are actually having uh, it's, it's neighbor data in the, in the memory layout is actually zero, zero, 009. And after that, we move to the next, um, the next W, right? The C channel, I fill in the entire C channel, and then we start with the next W. And after we fill all the W, we go to the next uh, H dimension. It fill in the entire channel, and then the next W, next W, and next H. So filling the entire C channel, the entire C channel. Okay. So anyone can guess what is the uh, um, advantage of having consecutive data in the C channel, uh, C channel dimension for consecutive data. What kind of uh, convolution might benefit from such data layout? That one. The other one. Pointwise, yeah. right? Since pointwise is actually doing a reduction in the channel dimension. So pointwise, we are uh, doing a reduction of the entire channel. Right? Have a one by one convolution that has no spatial, uh, no spatial uh, locality, only the channel level locality. Right? We want to um, do a matrix vector product to uh, project this channel to another channel. Right? So such. Um, an HWC format, um, which is used by default for TensorFlow, is good for channel-wise reduction. Versus if we have NCHW, since H and W, the spatial locality is better. Uh, if we use um, uh, three by three, five by five, seven by seven, those spatial convolutions. Right? This is just finishing up all the animations in the channel dimension. And finally, uh, there is a very rare uh, data layout called CHWN format, where N is actually the uh, inner group. So if we that set up, okay, zero, zero, zero is here. And the next one in the uh, adjacent in the memory is actually uh, in, the, in the next batch. Okay? So in the, if it is the uh, weight, then it will be in another kernel. Right. And then uh, we are going to lay out in the, such a format, building the entire uh, channel. Okay. And then we move to the next channel, the first N and then the second N, building this channel again. And finally, we go to the last channel, uh, the first N, and then first uh, N equal to zero, and then the one, zero, one, zero, one, et cetera. This is very rarely used though. Uh, so the key uh, uh, interesting part is that uh, different uh, circumstances require benefit from different data layouts. For example, um, point-wise convolution will benefit from such NHWC data formats. Well, depth-wise depth -wise convolution, which requires spatial locality, will prefer this NCHW format. So that's something to keep in mind um, by, uh, by looking into 
your uh, workload, you can uh, specify what kind of data layout is better for the case. And data uh, shuffling is actually quite expensive. All right, so we introduced uh, these two backgrounds. One is related to microcontroller. What is the memory hierarchy? What is the constraints? Um, and then we also introduced the uh, workload, the neural networks. And we talk about different data layouts for the tensors. Now we can mingle these two together and talk about how do we efficiently map uh, these neural network, these tensor operations onto um, the uh, microcontrollers, which we are going to introduce this kind of engine. So there's a lot of concepts we are going to introduce. So I'm going to go, go relatively slowly to talk about these optimization techniques in Tiny Engine. Um, so uh, before we jump into the details, Tiny Engine is fully uh, open source. So if you have a laptop, you can uh, go to uh, the GitHub and try to search for uh, MIT Hard Lab Tiny Engine. So that all the code is available over there. Since uh, in this lecture, now uh, we also gave you all the code uh, for you to use Tiny Engine to uh, do a real world uh, uh, demo, right? So I, uh, we didn't uh, uh, give you a lot of uh, code writing um, assignment, but we do have a lot of good ideas uh, you can pursue for your final project. For example, uh, implementing a few other uh, kernels. Uh, if you're interested in this direction, feel free to contact me or the TA. Um, if you want to dive deeper into these techniques. So this is the um, recipe we are going to uh, talk about today. There are roughly uh, a couple of techniques, eight or nine techniques we can, that we can use to boost the performance of uh, deep neural nets on microcontrollers. Actually, there are um, eight techniques, okay? I believe uh, in our assignment, we gave you uh, seven techniques to, to try. So uh, let's get started with them one by one. First technique we're going to introduce is loop and rolling. You know, working with tensors usually boils down to uh, writing a multiple for loops. For example, writing a uh, matrix multiplication require three for loops. Writing a matrix, uh, writing a uh, 3D, uh, the Normal convolution is six for loops, right? So we're going to first talk about several uh, techniques related to loops, including loop unrolling, uh, loop reordering, and also loop tidy. Okay. So, and then we are going to talk. These are mostly focusing on uh, branch branch instructions and also memory. And then we are going to talk about this data, right? Single instruction, multiple data. Since in computer architecture. Um, you wanna, the payload is actually doing the computation, but the overhead is really uh, this is, uh, doing with these instructions, avoiding this instruction overhead. So we wanna um, try to um, amortize this instruction overhead by having one single instruction that can, over, uh, that can do a multiple data, right? So CMD uh, technique. Another technique with respect to data layout using the image to column uh, technique to convert this convolution into what we already have, which is matrix modification. Okay. So matrix modification is very widely used by super well developed kernel. Right. Uh, can we use the existing uh, convolution kernels, uh, existing matrix modification kernels to implement convolution? So that's uh, image uh, to column convolution. And then we are going to talk about another technique um, for depth-wise convolution, since depth-wise convolution is just so widely used uh, in this uh, memory constraint uh, uh, read, uh, places, uh, thanks to uh, uh, depth-wise convolution, um, we are going to talk about um, the data layout for point-wise and also for uh, depth-wise convolutions. Finally, there is a very interesting algorithm called Winograd convolution, which actually can reduce in theory, by theory, reduce the number of uh, multiplication and adds for uh, when you're running neural nets. Um, however, that will explode uh, the weight, um, which is not feasible for microcontrollers, which has only 
one or two megabytes of flash. So that's why this is the only technique we uh, don't have in our lab. But all the, uh, about seven techniques, we are going to see them in the lab. It will be uh, very interesting. So take the lecture and then go home to take the lab to reinforce what we have learned in the lecture. So that's how we design, design the lab. Okay, so let's start with the uh, first technique, loop and rolling. So what is loop and rolling? So uh, given a um, for, uh, uh, give a piece of code that has three for loops, okay? So what are the overhead over here compared with uh, without a for loop, just, just the instructions? We have to deal with the pointers, right? We have to check the boundary for i, for j, for k, uh, whether it's uh, smaller than n, then we have to do the a loop tests, we have to manipulate the, the pointers, and also we have to do the branch prediction. Right? So in computer architecture, um, the uh, program counter, short for PC, is usually PC plus four, jumping from one instruction to another, to the next one, sequentially. Right? So when we have such uh, whole loops, we have to have such conditional branches, right? Conditional branch means that we have to test uh, if they are larger or smaller than a certain value. Um, uh, if a certain criteria is met, we have to, uh, instead of PC plus four, we have to jump to uh, another uh, location in the, in the code, right? Uh, so in order to avoid those bubbles, if we have a, um, we have to, usually there is a very deep pipeline in the computer. So um, we cannot wait for the uh, ALU to give you the results before we, we want to uh, fetch the next instruction. Therefore, the branch prediction becomes important. Although we don't know whether we are going to just use the next instruction or we are going to um, jump into a previous instruction, we just predict we are going to do one of them. But such prediction has overhead, especially when the prediction is wrong. You have to flush the entire pipeline to uh, restart uh, at the correct location and squash uh, those wrong predictions. So that's the uh, branch prediction overhead. Uh, so um, loop and routing is actually be able to uh, reduce those overheads by reducing the number of um, loops. No question here. So what would look like that? Which is the one for the range of numbers? Won't the branch prediction fail exactly once? That's just going to fix the end of the loop. So uh, during the, if the loop is very regular, so the overhead is actually not large. Maybe um, just during the uh, very end of the, of the loop. Right. Uh, but if the kernel size is pretty small, loop is a is kind of three, but it's also not trivial. Or if the after a lot of pooling, the um, resolution becomes seven by seven, that's also not a big number. Initially, you have 224 by 224, 112 by 112, finally only seven by seven. Okay. So what does loop and rolling do? So this is the original matrix multiplication for loop, okay, IJK, AIK times BKJ, we have a common K in the middle, it gets canceled, so we get CIJ. Right? So if we, I know this by four, the K is no longer um, step, with step size of one. Right now it's with step size of four. So with every, every K here, we are going to do four operations rather than one operation in the loop. Okay? With every K, we are going to calculate AIK, BKJ, as well as um, uh, K, uh, K, K, K plus one, K plus two, and also K plus three. Right? So in this case, uh, we are reducing the um, number of uh, pointer operations from n square to the one, one quarter of n square. And the number of loop tests also reduced um, to only one quarter of the uh, n square. But what is the overhead here? There's no free lunch, right? 
So the code size okay, of the most inner loop is actually, uh, the size is actually four times as this original size, because previously we only write a single line of code. Now we need to write four lines of code. Right? So um, each line of code is probably taking 32 bits, that's four bytes. That's not a big issue at all for uh, like desktop computers. But for microcontroller, we have only uh, one megabyte of flash to store everything, including the code segment. So that could be a pretty big issue uh, if um, the code size is too big. Right? So there's no free lunch. There's also, there's always some trade off. Okay, so um, that's a uh, loop I wrote in to reduce this branching. Uh, 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 this branching overhead. Right? And next we have this loop reorder, right? which is a loop transformation technique um, so that we can optimize the program at a given time by reordering the sequence of the follow. So let's uh, look at this example again. So for IJK, we are accessing the A matrix okay? and also the B matrix. So if we are accessing them in I, I, K, A, I, K, B, K, J manner, but K is inside J, J is inside I, yes. So if you look at K, which one is the inner loop? K is inner loop. Right? So uh, we are actually doing row-wise uh, access of the map. But for B, so J is the uh, inner loop. Uh, actually, K is the inner loop. So this dimension is actually the inner loop. So we are actually uh, accessing them in a column wise manner. Okay? So if we store the data in the row wise manner, but we are accessing them in a, in a column uh, wise manner, then we have poor data locality because B0 and B10, they are not contiguous stored in the memory. Right? So that is pretty bad. So um, the rule of thumb is data movement is more expensive. So usually if you have a pack line, uh, if every number is only one byte, so this is a, um, uh, four numbers is 32 bytes. So if you have a cache line of 64, uh, 64 bytes, then you can simultaneously store eight uh, one byte numbers. Right? So it's like any different if B0, zero, zero B01 is also uh, brought in in the cache line, right? Since each cache line can contain multiple uh, components, you will be a uh, spatial uh, locality. But if you can meet B0, you may as well access everything after that, which is contiguous in memory. However, B10 is not, right? It's not contiguous in memory. Therefore, uh, if you access them at the same time, you will bring in another cache line. Uh, which will uh, probably uh, kick, off, kick off some of the previous cache lines due to the poor locality. Okay. Um, so that's why um, when we have this scenario where we have a cache line and uh, uh, it's, it's more beneficial to uh, continuously access the uh, memory. Uh, we change um, that locality issue. Actually, we can reduce the cache means by uh, reordering the loops. For example, uh, rather than having uh, I uh, and J, uh, J and K, here we can, have, we can have K and J instead. And so if we reorder the loop, J becomes the loop, J becomes the main, and K becomes the author. In that case, we are accessing the B matrix um, in a row wise manner, which makes it uh, uh, has better uh, cache locality. And so there's uh, usually such consideration about the cache line versus data locality versus the loop order. Okay, let's continue our discussion about an engine. A brief recap about, about a big picture, right? So we have uh, very scarce resource, very little resource on microcontrollers. Uh, therefore, um, the memory footprint is very uh, important. We want to reduce the memory footprint and utilize cache locality as much as possible. And also, uh, our goal is to deploy deep neural nets on microcontrollers. One way is, of course, you can use the existing libraries like 
TensorFlow micro, et cetera, um, to, um, uh, to the inference. But the most efficient way actually is to write your own kernel um, that take advantage of all these techniques, all these considerations, removing those branching overhead, uh, uh, taking advantage of the memory locality and CMD operations and also these transformations. Right? So we're almost there. We uh, already learned two techniques. One is loop unrolling and the other is loop reordering uh, to improve the cache locality and reduce data movement. The next technique we're going to introduce is the loop tidy. Okay? So which is a loop transformation techniques that can reduce uh, the memory accesses by partitioning the loop into iterations into small chunks. So each small chunk can fit in the SRAM in the cache. Okay, so this is a, a pretty big matrix of size n. So the total access element, your memory, also called the memory footprint, uh, is pretty big. It could be as large as n squared. For example, Alex said for the last FC layer, that's uh, 4096, 4096 by 4096. So that's 4K uh, by 4K. That's altogether 16 million. Uh, numbers you have to access. So 16 million is pretty big. It's way larger than what we have for a few a couple of hundred a uh, couple of uh, kilobytes, right? Therefore, the idea is to block to do to just uh, do computation on a smaller subset, a smaller chunk of such data, such that a smaller chunk can fit um, um, the cache size. Okay, initially the B, the dimension is larger than the cache size, but we want to partition the loop. Okay? So we can fit the, uh, a smaller chunk of that so that they can fit into the cache. Okay? And also stay uh, ensure we just work on a small uh, a footprint so that uh, the footprint is smaller than the cache size. For example, we can, rather than uh, working on the entire matrix with three loops, now we introduce one extra uh, loop for this J dimension. Okay? Previously we have J dimension. Now we have another dimension for J, uh, another uh, for loop for J with a, a larger set size. So we are basically dividing it in the vertical dimension with several chunks. So rather than previously we have N square, now we have N by the tile size of memory footprint, which would be much larger, smaller if tile size is smaller than N. Does this solve the problem of uh, R n versus small cache size? If n is pretty huge, this still cannot fit in the, in the cache size, right? Um, therefore, we can do um, a tiling in another dimension. Previously, we just did a tiling in the J dimension, okay? J dimension. Now we also want to do tiling for the K dimension. Okay? We have a two by K in the, in the book order. And now we chunk not in the vertical dimension, but also in the horizontal dimension. So now, rather than using uh, n times the tile size of memory footprint, what is the new memory footprint? This tile size squared, right? It's much smaller for the B matrix. But for A matrix, um, it still um, only uh, partially solved the problem because rather than n square, now it is n times the tile size of memory footprint. So if n is pretty big, this number could also be pretty large. So what's the solution here? If we want to fit both A and B in the cache, we need to, we need to do another uh, uh, tidy, right? So previously we tile the K, okay? We tile the K, we should also have I. Okay, so these three for loops become six for loops. So that uh, even for A, previously uh, that require N by tile size, now it's tile size square. Okay. Um, so the memory footprint is no longer related to N, but it's just related to the tile size. If we make this tile size square, considering all the matrices together, Fit within the eight kilobytes of our one cache of a microcontroller, 
then the locality of the program becomes much, uh, much better. So this is pretty simple for microcontroller that's if this is it, but if we have multiple uh, levels of, so this is the summary, right? So we reduce the memory footprint from n square to a uh, tau size square uh, for both A matrix, P matrix, and also the C matrix. And how do we determine this, this tau size? We we'll just make sure the memory footprint is added together is smaller than our uh, edge size. Like we mentioned, if we have multiple uh, levels of cache, um, for example, L1 cache is eight kilobytes, but maybe L2 cache is bigger, then what do we do? We wanna uh, further, um, for example, the inner three for loops, we wanna fit everything to L1 cache, and then we add another for loop, we wanna make sure uh, the L2 size, many times the L1 size can fit the L2 cache. Okay. Um, and so on. So we add another um, tile loop. So we previously we have six loops, now we have seven loops. We just continue to uh, do multi level of padding to fit multi level of cache, uh, cache sizes. So a lot of manual uh, tiling and, and determining tile size is pretty uh, cumbersome. There is also such automated tools that I highly, highly recommend you to try such as TBM that can perform such uh, tiling automatically for these tensor programs, which is quite useful. Okay, so the next uh, concept is actually CMD, very widely used. Uh, yeah. Cash oblivious uh, approaches for the motivation now Perfection of this, or I'm not aware of actually. Uh, the, the, the motivation is like you have some sensitive data, but uh, what is the asking this about is the asking where you find out how it's like. So, independent of the cache sizes, uh, we can discuss that offline. I'm not quite aware of this kind of stuff. Okay, hey, so um, next is CMD, uh, CMD techniques. So we know uh, those instruction overhead is pretty big, right? We have to determine which PC do we fetch next, right? And also um, uh, the dependencies, whether we can reorder the instructions uh, to do all of other execution and to do uh, a lot of uh, predictions uh, and also speculations, right? If, you, if the speculation is wrong, we also have to squash all the instructions that are wrongly fetched into the pipeline. And as the pipeline gets deeper and deeper, those overhead could be uh, pretty big, right? So we want to um, amortize those instruction overhead. You fetch one instruction, but you execute on multiple pieces of data, right? So that's the idea of CMD. Uh, before introducing uh, the details, let me start with the background, right? So introduce what is the uh, instruction? What is the instruction set architecture? Uh, this is just a reminder of the 6004. If you have taken it, it should be uh, pretty straightforward. So instruction set architecture is the contract between the software and the hardware. Contract means uh, the policy and also the, the rules, how do you write programs, and, and also uh, how is that, that translated uh, to the machine code, right? So, uh, it gives you the abstraction of the hardware by such instruction uh, set architectures. Uh, this is the example of an instruction set. You can have those arithmetic instructions like add and subtract, multiply, uh, these compare instructions to, repair, uh, to return one or zero, if it's larger or smaller. And then you have this branching overhead, including those unconditional jumps. You just jump to a designated uh, PC versus those conditional uh, branches where you first compare uh, two registers and depending on the results, you are going to either jump or continue fetching PC plus four, right? And then we are gonna have this load and store instructions to manipulate the memory, read and write uh, from and to memory. Finally, we have these IO instructions, okay? So 
uh, I/O for a device, including uh, the monitor, the keyboard, etc. Category-wise, there are roughly uh, two categories of ISA. Uh, the CISC standing for complex instruction set up uh, a computer versus the RISC, which is reduced instruction set computer. Okay? So for six machines, uh, you have many big and specialized instructions. Uh, some of them might be only uh, rarely used. So uh, Intel x86 is uh, using RISC, uh, using CISC. For risk, um, each uh, instruction is pretty simple. It can do a very uh, smaller amount of work, um, but we can have multiple of them. Okay. Our example, uh, like adding two numbers for a, a, a CISC uh, instruction, that could be uh, just one uh, client instruction that has both memory access and also arithmetic operations versus a risk architecture you may um, do them separately. Load A and B, add them together, and finally store them back to the registers. And for microcontrollers, uh, uh, we are using this RISC um, instruction set architectures. Um, since we talk about those instructions, it's not free lunch, right? We have to, to pay those instruction overhead to do the arithmetic operations, which is modification and also write uh, modification and addition in, in tensor operations operations for neural networks, right? So we want to do a single instruction on multiple data. And since the computational workload for deep learning is highly deterministic and it's very regular, right? Um, not to mention those sparse workload is separate, but for the uh, unproved model, it's really a dense model. A dense workload, uh, the uh, operation is operated consecutively. Yeah? Right. So therefore, we can easily do the same thing. Uh, lock step for A1, for A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, 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 A3, A3. Right. So we write one modification instruction. Uh, previously, it operated on only a single piece of data, A and B. Now we operate on four pieces of data at the same time in lock step. So that is called uh, the same thing. Okay. Uh, that is available on mostly all current processors. You just need to find their menu to find uh, their, their um, uh, digital instruction, how to use uh, this ISA. For example, this is the conventional code uh, in, uh, implementing this matrix modification. Um, we need n to the power of three arithmetic operations. But with CD, with one instruction, we can actually uh, do four uh, matrix, uh, we, can, we can do actually four um, element-wise modification and additions. Okay? So arithmetic operations is reduced by, uh, by four times. Here, we're uh, using the uh, CMD intrinsics. So the instruction is called CMD intrinsics. Okay? Uh, so every time we are actually doing four elements using just one instruction. Yeah, computing multiple modifications in mo uh, in one single in a single cycle. Right. And if we reduce the number of bits, for example, rather than one twenty eight bits, if we reduce uh, each number, so here each number is represented by uh, thirty two bits. If we reduce the bit number of bits, the number of operations can be even. Uh, even larger. Okay, so um, the next technique we are going to introduce is called the image to column convolution. Okay. So, you know, those matrix modification is very widely studied, and there is a lot of uh, high performance matrix modification kernel. So, the key idea here is can we use, um, rearrange the data so that we can directly utilize the existing matrix modification kernel to implement convolution. Okay. Um, so this is our uh, setup. We have the activation, uh, we have the kernel, we have the, uh, the output. Okay. So the input activation has multiple channels, and this is the XY dimension. Kernel size is three by three. Uh, the input channel, we have three input channels. Okay. We have four uh, output channels, four kernels in this case. And we are going to do how, how are we going to rearrange the data format so that we can cast such six for loop 
um, convolution problem into a three uh, three ball loop uh, convolution uh, matrix multiplication problem. For example, here this entire three by three by C this chunk of data will be um, have a um, thought product with this entire three by three by by C uh, kernel. Okay, we are going to repeat that for all the kernels. We are also going to repeat that for different locations. Okay, move by one to convolution. This is actually quite similar to matrix multiplication if you um, flatten uh, this piece of data rather than three by three, you flatten that by nine by one, right? And let's see how that works. So you flatten this entire three by three piece of data into a one by nine um, uh, tensor, right? So from A to M, okay? So here from A to C, this is F, G, H, this is K, L, M, right? So from A to M, we flatten that into a 1D array here. Right. And then when it moves to the next location, that will be PCT, GHI, LMN. Okay. So from P to N, we uh, flatten that into a 1D tensor. This, is, uh, this contains nine elements. Okay. So whenever we move by one window, okay, we have another row here. Right. So this is just the first input channel. We're going to do the same thing. For the second and the third input channel in um, in green and also in orange. Seems for the uh, convolution, it works um, that all the uh, demand, all the elements in the C channel will be reduced. Right? So uh, all these elements three by three by C, they are going to be reduced to a single value. So all these numbers multiplied by all these numbers will be reduced into a single value, so that we we can uh, construct this tensor. Why is k square c? Because we have kernel square okay, three by three, and the c is the number of channels. Okay, so we are reducing all these k square c elements uh, into one element. So this row multiplied by this column is reduced to one element. Okay, so this is about activation. How about the weight? How do we reshuffle or shuffle the uh, lay out the, the memory uh, for the weight. So here we have four kernels in four different colors, right? So um, we, we can talk about each kernel separately. So starting with a green kernel, okay? So the green kernel from uh, zero to eight, we're going to lay out, lay them out vertically in memory so that it can be uh, have a dot product with the, with the uh, activations, right? So uh, this dark, uh, uh, blue is going to interact uh, with the light, uh, light green over there. So this dark blue is going to interact with the light green right here. Okay. And similarly for uh, this green, we can interact with the green color here because this green color is also interacting with the dark green color over there. So how, how many elements are there in the, in the column? It's also K square by C Right. Since they are doing the dot product, the number of elements for the activations and the weights, they are the same. Okay. And how many dot products do we have to do? Um, so uh, this row by this column produces only one atom. Right. Since we have four such kernels, okay, green, red, gray, and also blue, we have, uh, have them in parallel laid out in the memory. Okay. So that um, this element, uh, this row is not only interacting with the first kernel, but also all the three other kernels in parallel. Okay. So in this way, we actually converted a convolution into a matrix multiplication. Okay, so the each row is pretty bulky. It's no longer pretty. It, it, it's, it's actually a kernel size squared times c number of elements that's going to be reduced to a single element. So what is the dimension of the uh, output. It is actually the dimension here, right? So dimension. What is the dimension here? It's the number of windows, right? So you, whenever you have a window, we have a row, right? So in, considering the padding, this is actually the h by w, right? Considering the padding, so the output height is also h by w. 
and with what is output width it is equal to the number of kernels in this case right so here we have four kernels therefore we have four uh, output channels right so that's exactly the output tensor dimension for the output activation right? h by w by the output output channel so there's a very fundamental technique use convolution and use matrix multiplication to implement convolution yeah exactly so the, my next question i was just about to ask what is the uh memory footprint uh compared with for this matrix compared with the tensor over here is actually nine times larger because each element is contributing to nine different windows for three by three kernel right so this tensor's um, memory footprint is actually nine times larger right so the solution for that is actually using the implicit gmm which actually we're using that for this is torch sparse paper rather than materializing the tensor in memory without everything before computation we just calculate them on the fly without having to lay out uh, this piece of data in memory but we remember where each data is in the original tensor and we directly access the original tensor using the, the mapping between the location here versus the location over there so that's called the implicit gmm and solve this memory overhead problem okay and add a variant of direct convolution and operates directly on the input weight the directly operates on the input weight rather than having to materialize them first into this format which is nine times uh, larger um, and um, require additional uh, memory space all right let's move to the next technique which is in place uh, depth-wise convolution right so depth-wise convolution is kind of special there is no channel-wise reduction each channel is independent right um, so but it's also very widely used in mobile nets and uh, those uh, lightweight neural networks um, so um, let's review the structure together okay? so we start with the one by one convolution that increases the number of channels by three to six times and then runs a depth-wise convolution channel by channel okay there's no reduction across the channels but each channel is independent finally it's followed by another one by one convolution we can view it in another way so the width of the uh, in this rectangle uh, indicates the number of channels okay? the smaller channel expanded by three or six times and then shrink it so that's called the inverted bottleneck the number of channels here is actually much larger than the one by one um, convolution before it and after that so that's what's what's the drawback over there you also increase the peak activation by a large margin because same resolution, but the number of channels is three to six times larger than, uh, than what is here. Okay. So that's a, a, a key problem. Since uh, SRAM, our uh, microcontroller, we have very limited SRAM, only 320 kilobytes. Such large expansion ratio is very harmful. How do we try to avoid that? So conventional method, um, we keep the uh, this is the input this is the output okay there's no dependency across channels uh, it's actually one-to-one -one mapping okay so conventional implementation tensor flow like micro the peak memory is actually two times the hw times c okay, since you have input you have the output okay so is that really necessary uh, to, to compute the stepwise convolution uh, that maps this channel to this channel this screen channel to this screen channel so the output green channel doesn't depend on the red channel or orange channel or the yellow or the, uh, or the blue channel it not only depends on the original green channel so is it really necessary to have full chw memory footprint actually it's not necessary right since there's a lot of redundancy in the buffer management 
we can actually do much better than, than that by just uh, using one extra uh, buffer space. Okay, we calculate uh, the um, output since the output doesn't depend on the other channels, only depends on the input channel, okay, which is channel one, and then we write back to the original place. And then we can uh, disregard that since the future computation doesn't depend on it at all. Right? So we can uh, write it back and then reuse this actual temporary buffer to deal with the second channel. Okay? And write it back uh, to the second channel, similarly for the later channels. So we we'll only need one actual channel of the temporary buffer and write back um, the output in place where it was originally located. So that would require only one plus C times HW of memory frequency, which actually when N is pretty large, what is the saving here? Uh, so when C is pretty large, what is the saving here? Almost 2x, right? 2C over 1 plus C. Be serialized, yes. But you have uh, plenty of uh, parallelization since you can compute nine elements at the same time that can al already uh, saturate the limited computation capability of a microcontroller. Right, this is actually trading uh, parallelism for, yeah. for memory. But microcontroller, the CMD width is usually two. We can only compute two, uh, two multiplications in one cycle. So this, uh, this parallelism is okay. But for GPU, this is not okay. All right, so next one, MHWC for pointwise convolution and MCHW for depthwise convolution. We actually briefly alluded this already in the beginning of the lecture where uh, when we are dealing with the uh, data layout, it matters a lot whether we are doing in this direction or H HWCQ direction. So imagine we have, um, uh, this is the one by one convolution, right? The one by one convolution if you use NH, uh, NCHW format, what happens? Actually, we are accessing um, zero and nine in different locations, not, contig not contiguous locations since we are doing the reduction in the C dimension, which incurs a lot of irregular memory access and non-contiguous memory access, okay, which is hurting the cache locality. But if you, if you store them in the NHWC format, then C is in the inner loop, zero and nine, and it's 81 are actually consecutive in memory so that we can actually access different elements in a sequential manner rather than uh, in a strided manner. Okay, so this becomes much more friendly uh, using the NHWC for one by one convolution. Uh, what about the um, mapswise convolution? Okay. Uh, there's no dependency across channels, there's, but there's, there's spatial locality if you use uh, kernel size larger, by, larger than one. Right? So if we use the NHWC format, okay, C is in this direction. Mapswise uh, convolution is to access zero, one, two consecutively. Zero, one, two, but they are not consecutively memory. Uh, so there is uh, the bad uh, strided memory access pattern, which is not cache locality friendly. But if we lay, lay them out in NCHW format, right, so we can actually have zero, one, two consecutive in memory. So um, the memory access pattern is much more friendly. And finally, we'll talk about Wino write convolution, which is a very um, amazing method that can reduce the number of floating point uh, the arithmetic operations. Say from input to output, this is the filter. Uh, if we do a uh, computation for one output element, how many operations do we need? We need nine operations, okay? Um, but if we have C channels, that require nine C computation, uh, arithmetic operations, including uh, actually arithmetic uh, nine C max. That right? max is very accurate since it's not necessary for the point. Right? So we need nine C uh, max if we want to produce only one output. Uh, but if we have, uh, we are going to produce four outputs that require 30, uh, 36 C operations. Okay? We have to move the window 
by four times in order to produce four outputs. And mathematically, we can do such transformation to transform uh, the tensor, the four by four tensor into another four by four tensor um, using purely uh, plus one, minus one, 0 0.5, two, but can be done uh, by shift rather than uh, arithmetic, uh, rather than multiplication. Similarly, for the, for the kernel, we can also do such transformation by having the matrix on the left and other matrix uh, on the right uh, to transform, transform it into a uh, four by four matrix. And uh, what either way it, uh, is saying, convolution actually equal to dot product element wise multiplication of these two tensors. And each tensor is four by four by by C doing element wise um, uh, product and then just sum them up across the channel dimension. Then we get this four by four matrix. And then we do another output transform having the matrix on the left and the matrix on the right for the modification, which boils down to a shift. And then we, uh, 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 we can produce the final output and they are mathematically equal, okay? So if we not consider this data transform, which can be done by shift operations, if we just consider um, this matrix, uh, this element-wise multiplications that require how many uh, max? So uh, six, uh, four by four by C. So the sixteen C max. Previously we require thirty-six C max. Now it's only sixteen C max. That's two point two five uh, fewer number of max. This is very widely used in NVIDIA. Uh, tensor RT libraries, right? There is not necessarily from three to four, there's also other transformations for different kernel sizes. And you can feel free to uh, refer to uh, tensor RT for more information. But here we are showing the transformation matrix. Why we is very cheap? Because the component is one, zero minus one, which is very easy to calculate just uh, uh, half and minus half which can be easily done by shift operations okay? for all these uh, transformation matrices that is modified to the left or to the right of the original um, filter, original data, input data. Okay? So all these transformations can be easily implemented by shift, making it very computationally um, efficient. What is the drawback here? Usually we have to transform pre-compute the filter transformation. It used to be a three by three uh, tensor, but after the transformation, that becomes a after the transformation that becomes a four by four tensor. So that actually increased the, the weight size, which is the drawback, and that's why and that's the reason why we didn't actually implement this idea on microcontroller because it's a very limited memory footprint. But this is a very important technique for GPUs. Uh, is this a special case of doing discrete Fourier transform? Oh, yes, yes. Actually, uh, this is a special case, a uh, very similar case to the Fourier transform. And another uh, constraint is that the weight has to be constant so that we can pre compute it, which does, does not apply to on device training. So, if you want to do training, this method actually doesn't apply. That's one benefit of sparse update, which we learned in last week, right? If we, with certain layers, we choose not to update them. Um, the weight is constant, therefore we can keep uh, this Wienerwald transformation, right? So we can use Wienerwald convolution rather than conventional convolution because the weights are constant uh, for sparse updates. So that's another benefit for sparse updates that enable us to also use Wienerwald convolution for training, the forward pass in the training stack. Okay, so that concludes the eight techniques we introduced for Tiny Engine, and that is all uh, open source into uh, uh, this uh, this repo. If you go to MIT Han Lab, MCU Net, and also MIT Han Lab slash Tiny Engine, this, this repo actually contains all the techniques to support the neural networks here. And this is summary for today's lecture. We introduced microcontrollers, data layout for neural nets, and how to deploy them. And in lab four, um, we are going to implement all we um, uh, to, to experience, not necessarily implement, but we, we implement a lot for you already. 
you uh, you can just play with these different techniques. Sometimes we are moving, we are going to see the problem. That's right. And if you have any questions, you can always uh, leave feedback or go to our office hours. And I hope you can enjoy the last lab in the lecture. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's the end for today's lecture.